Good evening, everyone. I tried to get the organizers to change the sequence uh, so I'd speak last, uh, but they would have none of it. Uh, let me begin by thanking the ALA community for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to address you. I first met three of the founders in 1999 when they came to the United Bank for Africa as employees of McKinsey. And McKinsey was then doing strategy for the bank with Kim Belosage as a chairman. And I always tell people about Fred Swanica. Fred and I, together in 2000, built the first very first credit scorecard in the Nigerian economy. So when Fred said he was going to do this, I had no doubt that he would succeed. As at the time Fred came to UBA, we had a million customers. We were lending to 50,000 of them. It took us six months to approve a credit. By the time he finished, we were approving loans in three minutes. And It now seems um, so commonplace because all banks in Nigeria have, or most banks have scorecards. But when UBA introduced what was then called the No Wahala Loan, it was a real miracle where, pe <laughs> where people could actually apply for a loan and get an offer letter in 24 hours. And that was all thanks to Fred Swanica. Just to say that long before ALA, he's a young man who's always set his eyes on achieving things and he's got things that he's delivered and touched people's lives. When I met Peter Momba in 1999, I think, I was, I think 2006, when I came on a visit to South Africa, I had two of my daughters, and he told me about ALA and their plans set up ALA. My daughters fell in love with the school before it had been set up. And I'm happy to say that two of my daughters came to LA have passed to LA, one of them graduated from New York University, one of them is graduating in June from the American University in Paris, and I'm very proud of what they have become. <laughs> They're also serious troublemakers. You know, um, Fred talks about faith, about karma, you know, and what goes around comes around. My daughters are giving me more trouble than I gave my parents. As I said at the session today, a few weeks ago, Shahida came, came up to me with an article I had written in 2000, arguing that Islam had nothing against women in leadership. And having confirmed that I actually wrote that article, asked me why she cannot be the next Emir of Kano. Now, when I sent Shahida to ALA, I was thinking she would try to be governor or minister or president. I didn't think she was going to try to be an emir, but apparently she wants to be the next emir of Kano. <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't stop there. Um, she's been quite harmful to my reputation. Uh, whenever people talk about me as a progressive liberal, she's like, look, that man is better than most northern Nigerian men, but he is no progressive. <laughs> and, and her evidence is that I've been emir for almost four years, and I have not appointed a single woman to my emirate council. So she says, go and tell him to practice what he preaches. <laughs> but I suppose when you send your children to ALA, you have to be ready for whatever comes, and you've got to accept it. Um, and I, and I think, um, I'm sure all of us would accept that this is the kind of generation we want to have of African leaders and African women, and this is the kind of spirit that we'd like to encourage. So, so thank you, Ele. Now I've been asked to challenge this audience. And 
what I will do is speak a little about one of the major challenges I face in my role as Amir and see how this audience can help fix that challenge and also fix it across Africa. We all have a problem. We all know that in most parts of Africa, we have a problem with education, especially girl child education. Now, I was speaking to Ms. Michelle yesterday. Every time we talk about education, we talk about culture, we talk about religion, we talk about interpretation. We believe if we go and talk to parents and change their attitudes towards education, we'll have more girl children educated. But we miss one point, that sometimes the culture that we see is not a culture of Africa or a culture of Islam or a culture of Christianity, but a culture of poverty. You go to a village and talk to a man about sending his child to school, but there's no school in the village. And for his child to go to school, he needs to spend a lot of money to get that child to the nearest school, to and fro, and maintain that child. So there are millions and millions of girls in Africa who do not go to school, not because their parents do not want them to, but because they cannot afford that. In Kano State alone, we have three million children out of school. One out of six children out of school in the world is Nigerian. And the bulk of those children are in the north. There isn't enough money in government to build enough schools to educate those children. Now, of course, there are other things. We have to look at the rate at which we produce those children. We have to look at the, the um, family structures. We have to look at child spacing and so on. But you still have to provide education for those who have been born. Now, I'll share with you three thoughts I have, which I have put on the table and which I'm pursuing ask you to think how you can key into these um, thoughts and how we can roll this out across all the areas where we have out of school children. The first is the schools themselves. If you take a geospatial map of Kano, you'd be surprised to see that sometimes you have one school but in the same local government, you have maybe 30 different mosques. And one idea I have, which I, when I first put it up, obviously it was, there was a lot of resistance. Um, now I see a greater acceptance uh, by the establishment is why don't we turn each of those mosques into a school? Why don't we find teachers, put in place minimal equipment so that children can come out of the mosque early in the morning, pray, and then have school until afternoon without having to go far, without their parents having to cough up money, and without their being unsafe. How do we get this idea? Now, and it's not a new idea in Islam. Up till today, if you go to Fez in Morocco, the university runs classes in the mosque. And I've been there, and it's amazing. You see a teacher on, on a chair, uh, students on the rug with their laptops, and they're studying information technology, or studying French, or studying fiqh, or studying hadith, not just Islamic studies. And it's got many advantages. The children are safe. You don't need to invest in building new schools. You, uh, your capital outlay um, what you need to, to, to build a school is enough to train many teachers. You can have quality teachers. The girls are kept in school much longer than ordinarily. And when you think of things like Boko Haram, ask yourself, if a child learned mathematics and science in a mosque, is it possible for anyone later in life to tell him that Western education is haram?
So this is one. How do we do something like Suleiman the Magnificent did in Turkey, get funding from foundations into mosques and use those mosques as educational institutions such that Muslim children do get this education without bifurcating their lives and thinking there are two different types of education and one is halal and one is haram. The second issue is that we still live in a post-colonial world where the language of the colonial master is the only language recognized as the language of education. So if you take northern Nigeria, you've got millions of people who, well, they speak Hausa, they understand Hausa, they speak Arabic, they've studied Arabic, but they are illiterate because they do not speak English. Now you can be a medical doctor without learning a word of English. You can be a medical doctor in Chinese, in German, in French. You can be an engineer and be taught in Vietnamese. Why can't you be a medical doctor taught in an African language? Why? Why is it possible? Why do we go to a doctor trained in China who does not speak a word of English? Or a Vietnamese doctor or a French doctor who doesn't speak English? Why is it not possible for you to be a medical doctor studying medicine in Swahili or Hausa or Yoruba? The only, the only reason uh, I, I can think of is that we have still, uh, we have continued to colonize ourselves after being independent. Now, how can we begin a project a huge translation project of the sciences and education into African languages. Think of the great civilizations of the world. How did the Abbasid Empire become what it became? What it became? It was Harun Rashid starting a massive translation project using Christian and, Arab and Jewish scribes to translate Greek and Roman philosophy into Arabic. And the European Enlightenment built that through a retranslation of the works from Arabic into the Latin languages. Why can't we start a huge African Enlightenment by translating all these useful sciences? I, I say useful because some of them are for now useless. I keep telling the, our universities who teach philosophy, you know, when African students come out and start asking themselves, how do I know I exist? Then you know there's a problem, you know? <laughs> you exist because you're hungry, damn it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, well, I know Kim is PPE, but <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> but, but I really don't think we need Emmanuel Kant right now. Uh, we're not ready for him. So, why don't you do that? So this is the second thing. How can we, all over Africa, now just imagine, the millions of young Africans who today are out of school who are illiterate in English or French, who can't speak English or French or Portuguese, but who have learned to read and write either in their local language or in Arabic or some other language. If you mainstreamed them, if you provided them an opportunity to continue their education in that language, we would produce midwives, who produce nurses, who produce technicians, who would produce, I mean, take a faculty of agriculture in Kano. Why do you need English to farm? Why do you need English to manage a poultry? Do you speak to the chicken in English language? Do you direct the rice to grow? Do you discuss, do you have a conversation in English? What is so important about the language? Now, this is the second thing. How can we, instead of trying to make all those millions learn English and French and Portuguese, how can we give them the education in the language that they already understand and therefore shorten the path to progress? Uh, finally, is the use of technology. 
I was fortunate a year ago to have a meeting with the Spanish gentleman who used to be the CEO of a company called Telefonica, a telco in Europe, who after retirement set up a foundation called Pro Futuro. And he's a devout Catholic, and actually we met at the Vatican. And when he set up this foundation, he had gone to His Holiness the Pope to say, Your Holiness, I've made a lot of money. I would like to invest it in something useful, but I want to invest it in something that is close to your heart. And the Pope said, you know, I'm very much concerned about the number of out-of-school children I read all the time. What can you do about that? So this gentleman went back to Spain, invested a lot of money in technology, developed a program where with tablets, with some bandwidth, with solar power, he could train children, see, train teachers and train children in the rainforests of Bolivia. He's developed the entire European curriculum, science, technology, English, math. He's got it in English, in French, in Spanish, in Portuguese. I believe he's working on Arabic. With the computer, without a school, without a building, with the computer and the teachers, he's able to give children in the rainforest of Latin America the same kind of education they would get in a school in the city of London. A child of 13 learns robotics. This is the power of technology. How do we combine these three ideas? The idea of multiplying and bringing spaces closer by changing our concept of a classroom, turning mosques and other, any other building around into a class. The idea of bringing education closer still by reducing the language gap, delivering it in the language that the child already has, rather than requiring him to learn a foreign language, and by the way, a language of imperialist domination. And finally, bringing education closer through the use of technology, which we have seen can work. These are my challenges. And if you're ready to rise up to this challenge, the only thing I request is you use Kano as your pilot case. Thank you.